Hello and welcome to Cargo Masterminds presented by Cargo One. Cargo Masterminds is our exclusive one-to-one -one weekly interview series with leaders from the world's leading air cargo and logistic companies. My name is Reggie John. Before passenger service was even possible, American Airlines was an airmail pioneer. On October 50, 1944, American flew a DC-3 carrying more than 6,000 pounds of cargo from New York to California. The flight took 19 hours. That service morphed into the unrivaled air cargo service business around the world. Every year, American Airlines carries more than 2 billion pounds of cargo to more than 350 destinations around the world. For 79 years, American has delivered everything from fresh seafood and flowers to life-saving medicines and treasured museum artifacts. My guest today is Greg Schwedinger, President of American Airlines Cargo. Greg has been with American Airlines for more than 15 years. In October last year, Greg was appointed as the head of cargo at American Airlines. Greg joins me from Dallas to discuss cargo business at American Airlines and share his thoughts on global air freight industry. Greg, welcome to Cargo Masterminds. Such a pleasure to have you in this episode of Cargo Masterminds. Thanks, Reggie. It's great to be with you all. We're, we're here at our headquarters campus uh, in uh, Fort Worth, just south of DFW Airport. New, wonderful Skyview campus here. Uh, you can see uh, see it behind me. Uh, you may see people. It's about 8 in the morning here in Dallas-Fort Worth, and so you'll, you'll see our team members sort of filing into the building here over the next next hour or so that we're together. But it's great to be with you, Reggie. Thanks, Greg. Uh, in fact, I must admit that uh, Dallas was the first airport in the U.S. that I traveled to. Um, so it uh, Dallas actually is uh, quite dear to me. Greg, uh, you complete this month a uh, year in your current role as president of uh, American Airlines Cargo. How do you look back at the year gone by key highlights of uh, American Airlines Cargo? You're right, Reggie. It's it's it'll be one year exactly in the job about two weeks from now, beginning of October. You know, it, 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 despite the challenging year that we've faced here as as an industry, I can honestly say this has been one of the most rewarding and exciting years that I can recall in my professional life. You know, working at an airline uh, for you know nearly a couple of decades now, you, you certainly end up with a lot of memorable moments and certainly career defining moments as well. You know, many of them are oftentimes related to overcoming adversity. There's an awful lot of adversity that airlines and the business have had to, to face. But but for me, this year has been incredibly exciting, um, really for more positive reasons, um, despite a really challenging market environment that we've been in. You know, right when I joined the team back in October, we did a kind of medium-sized reorganization. And, and a lot of those changes that we've we put in place with respect to how we've organized our team and who's leading it are really working out well. We put some new leaders in place. Um, who are doing a fantastic job. They've kind of either uh, added new responsibility or changed responsibility. I've had a chance to travel uh, quite a bit to go out and meet our teams. Uh, many of our customers, our operational ground handling partners, uh, met you, Reggie, back in May in Munich at Air Cargo Europe. And so it's been fantastic to meet the community. You know, for us personally, uh, you know, our operational performance this year has been exceptional. Um, so that's been a nice development within my first year really performing at some of the highest levels that that we have in the history of AA Cargo. And, you know, we've accomplished an awful lot behind the scenes here um, that sets us up for growth, uh, sets us up to be efficient uh, and to continue to have successes. And so, you know, it's been a really busy year. Uh, hopefully the second year is as exciting and fulfilling for me professionally as the first one was. Uh, it may be nice too if the, the, the market improves a bit and the macro backdrop is a little bit more, more favorable. But no complaints, and I'm really loving my time with the team here and in, in, uh, in the role. Greg, I'd like to wish you all the best in the, as you step into the second year in the role. Uh, performance and traffic numbers for the third quarter will be announced later next month, uh, but going by the numbers available for the first two quarters of 2023, there is a noticeable decline in revenue, volume, and yield in comparison to the same periods in the previous year. Are they a reflection of the then weak market conditions and what do you expect the rest of the two quarters are going to look like? I think a lot of industries are, are certainly impacted by macroeconomic factors, global political factors to maybe a lesser extent, but are also um, prevalent. But I think what you're really seeing is a return to normalcy coming out of the COVID years, right? 
air freight was just supercharged as a result of the way in which consumers behaved differently, as well as um, you know challenges within the broader logistics framework. And so, I think what you're seeing is a bit of a, a reversion back to what might be deemed as as more normal. And so, as a result, you know the year over year comparisons. Um, for the first half of the year, and you know, it's no secret to the back half of the year will will be challenged. We're certainly getting easier comps as we move into the back part of 2023, as things began to normalize around the middle of 2022. 2022. But it's it's certainly been a really competitive market environment, and in a lot of ways, uh, you know, for us, that's a positive. It encourages innovation. We've had to be creative, look for ways to do things differently and more efficiently. You know, in particular, focusing on ways in which we can provide you know, solutions for our customers that that meet their needs. And we're we're open to all feedback. We talk to our customers regularly to learn about what they think those solutions might be. You know, 2019, I think, is really the last normal year that that you could say we had as an industry. And and I think you know we're performing really well uh, when you compare us to a 2019 base year, which we do to kind of help to have some perspective. The biggest difference between ourselves today and 2019 that'll impact our, our results is, is really twofold. One is we have a much smaller wide body fleet today than we did in 2019. You, you may recall, Reggie, that we retired our 767 fleet uh, right at the beginning of COVID. And we also retired our A330, both the 300s and 200s. And so our wide body fleet today is about 30 shells um, smaller than it was in 2019. We have begun taking deliveries of 7878s. We took four of them this year. Um, we'll take 789 starting around the middle uh, of next year. And we've got a large order book of 789s that'll continue starting next year over the next several years. And so our fleet will certainly be back to the size it was in 2019 in short order, but that's differences between today and 2019 on the fleet side. We also have some differences in our network. Uh, today, our Asia Pacific network is is smaller than it was pre-COVID. Um, you know, we're currently not serving markets like Beijing and Hong Kong. Uh, our service into Shanghai is not quite as robust as it was prior to the pandemic. And so, as you see passenger demand for travel into Asia continue to, to rebound, and it has been doing that, uh, I think our network will adjust, and in certain order will will have a Asia Pacific network that's on par with what we were uh, prior to the pandemic and and back in 2019. But yeah, you know, we had a, a really impressive summer schedule for the summer of 2023, uh, operating over 180 flights a day, uh, many of them transatlantic. We also had a really nice uh, network down to deep south Latin America from the U.S. And so, uh, you know, we're certainly uh, focused on the competitive marketplace, looking at ways in which we can say yes to our customers, both with our fleet, with our network, and with our products that we're developing to uh, to best serve our customers. Greg, the since you mentioned about your summer season, do you expect the numbers are going to look good given that you had a very strong summer season with an increase of more than 400 wide body flights uh, per month compared to the summer of uh, 2022? Yeah, the comps for summer 2022 were still really challenging, right? We had just wrapped up our cargo only flying um, around the end of the first quarter of last year. And so, you know, while I won't go too much into what our results will be for the quarter in advance of us publicly announcing those results in a month. Uh, you know, I think that you'll see that um, you know it feels as if the, the economy is starting to stabilize a bit, the markets are starting to stabilize to some extent. Um, hopefully this suggests that the industry is nearing an end of its journey back to normalcy out of the COVID years. Greg, well, what is your rating of the current uh, global air freight market conditions and what do you think is their impact on American Airlines Cargo, which fully relies on Bentley Cargo capacity of a very large global wide body passenger network. It's interesting, Reggie. I'm keeping a really close tab on you know a lot of economic factors, indicators that are being released not only here in the U.S. but also you know in, in other economies that we serve, in particular the EU. You know the macro factor, macro environment certainly has been challenging, right? The supply demand balance is, is really adjusting coming out of COVID. You know, you had a um, modal shift as a result of port congestions all throughout COVID. And so a lot of things that had never historically moved by air, were moving by air and that is all reversed. And so there's a little bit of a decline in the amount of volumes that we're seeing just simply as a result of modal shift. You know, passenger demand for air travel has been really strong this past summer, particularly in long haul international travel, which is really good for American Airlines, but it's brought an awful lot of supply, particularly belly space supply into the market. And so there's a bit of a, you know, an excess amount of supply. I'd say the last thing and really keeping an eye on are, are just the stability and, and, and strength of economies, particularly economies we've served. 
you know, it's no secret that a lot of economies, central banks and those economies have been doing everything they can to fight inflation. And inflation has been a problem across most of the geographies that we do business in. Uh, central banks have been trying to slow down economies to get inflation under control. And naturally, those slowing down of economy uh, tools that they use in their toolbox, things like increasing uh, interest rates, have that effect. And so you're seeing you know, a little bit less demand for goods and therefore fewer goods being manufactured as a result of efforts to slow down economies. But it feels as if you know, that's starting to stabilize to some extent. You know, one thing that's really interesting is as yields have come down in the business, I think some of the freighter economics are starting to change. And so with yields where they are at this point, you know, the serving uh, our forwarder needs on um, you know, belly space and passenger operated flights becomes more and more attractive. The break even point of putting it on a, a passenger operated aircraft on the belly as opposed to operating a freighter um, is starting to change. And so to some extent, that could serve as a bit of a yield floor. You know, we've heard from some of our customers, particularly those that operate a network of aircraft on their own, that they're uh, making efforts to potentially put a few of their aircraft on the ground and looking to move the business that formerly was moving via those aircraft onto passenger operations. And so that's certainly, um, you know, one silver lining to, you know, what's otherwise been, you know, a bit of a, a challenging macroeconomic environment that we find ourselves in. But you know, our network is you know, well tuned to to help with our customers and so helping our customers with their needs, and so you know, we're, we're we're certainly here and ready to move all of our customers' business in as creative a way as possible. We're certainly looking at you know ways to augment our network as well. We're doing a lot of interline business right now. The operational performance for that interline business is something we keep a really close eye on, and it's been good. That's in the industry not always the case, and uh, you know we're looking to just augment our network in any way possible so that. You know, we can be wherever, you know, economies are strongest or whatever products are strongest. Let's turn our attention to American Airlines cargo products. Uh, where do you have your top priority in terms of volume and value? What cargo products rank on top? It's like uh, choosing which of your children are your favorite, right? I think all of our products play a significant role to our customers and into our business mix. And so, you know, we're constantly looking at all of them to ensure that their their design, the attributes associated with them, meet the needs of our customers. But you know, if I had to pick out a few of them, certainly our temperature control solutions for our life science products, as well as our perishable business, are a priority for us. Even in this declining market, and I don't think this is unique to American, but even in this declining market that we've seen, we've had growth amongst our Expedite TC product, which is our temperature control solution. Uh, we've also seen an awful lot of perishable traffic that's remained very robust um, during the year, particularly between Europe and the U.S., uh, as well as up from Latin America into Miami. So you know, I think those are um, certainly a, an area of focus for us. We also are a bit unique in that we provide a uh, you know a human remains service as well as a, a live animal service. And so uh, those products continue to do well for us as well. They tend to be a bit more resilient to you know some of the broader market factors that are impacting general cargo. Tell us about the investment plans for cold chain warehouses for your pharma and perishable cargo products. Uh, American Airlines Cargo is IATA SEEF certified for pharma. And last year, we opened additional cold room facilities at JFK. Uh, do you plan to have more such investments? Yeah, it's been a big focus for our team. You know, obviously, our cold chain network and product offerings will always remain a priority for us. You know, The market certainly has demanded that of us this year. Uh, but I don't think that will change no matter what market dynamics are. Yeah, as you mentioned, we are CEIB certified uh, at our major stations, uh, DFW, Miami, and Philadelphia. We're also CEIB certified as a headquarters. And then we also have that certification at smaller stations and uh, many of our vendor partners who operate um, for us. Well, I don't have any announcements today. I think we're close on a couple of more stations, uh, hubs here within the U.S. that will have CEIB certification. So Stay tuned for some news, uh, hopefully in the coming weeks. You know, we're, we're making a lot of investments as well in our container solutions with partners like EnviroTainer, C-Safe, Sunoco ThermoSafe, and, and we're moving many of these containers for our customers on our aircraft today. So while I don't have any facility investments that I'm ready to announce today, uh, we're certainly making enhancements to our product offering, as I've mentioned um, working on uh, developing new ones as well, particularly in the small parcel uh, passive uh, temperature control space, as well as looking for ways that we can enhance our perishable products. But, you know, as I mentioned, we're listening to what our customers have to say, taking their feedback and, uh, you know, are adjusting our strategy daily based upon 
both what the market dictates as well as as you know, what our customers are, are asking of us. Greg, uh, how significant is the volume of uh, cargo shipment coming from e-commerce channels for American Airlines cargo? It's a good question, Reggie. It's one that we're, we're spending an awful t- lot of time thinking about right now. You know, e-commerce, as you know, uh, it continues to be one of the fastest growing sectors within the industry and uh, has fueled much of the industry growth that we've seen in recent years, certainly in the 2021-2022 time period when e-commerce was growing, uh, you know, exponentially, largely due to retail moving online, you know, as well as with consumers just changing the way in which they shop and look to, uh, you know, to procure uh, things that they need for their household, uh, for their offices, what have you. So, we do move a significant amount of e-commerce uh, traffic today across our network, particularly from Europe as well as Asia Pacific, and then uh, you know to a lesser extent throughout our domestic U.S. network. But most of the e-commerce that we handle today it moves within the framework of our traditional business model, right? So uh, we're working with forwarders; those forwarders have relationships with e-commerce shippers, and it moves um, within our you know kind of our traditional business model. But I'll tell you, Reggie, that we are currently working to evaluate how we can evolve our service offering to meet the needs of this growing sector. And so, um, you know, we've we've had some interesting conversations. We spent a lot of time kind of whiteboarding, you know, what the art of the possible is and, um, you know, are are really interested in doing more in in this sector. And I think it'll be a priority of ours to evolve here in 2024. Greg, is there a mechanism to really quantify your e-commerce shipment? Because a lot of it actually goes as a general cargo. So is there a mechanism and how, how are you able to measure that this is the amount of cargo that is coming from e-commerce channels? It is hard, Reggie, for us to, to understand entirely what, you know, what the contents and whether they came from, you know, an e-commerce shipper or some other type of platform. So for us, it is a little bit difficult to quantify what percentage of the volume we move falls within the category. Uh, but we do have a lot of interesting insights. You know, we talk to many of our hubs um, our, our hub partners, like for example, here at DFW, we've had conversations around some of the e-commerce that they're familiar is moving into DFW from you know points abroad, traditionally on freighters, and and looking at you know whether or not American Airlines can provide you know a secondary uh, solution. As you know, we've got a dramatically large narrow-body network here at DFW as well as in many of our other hubs, and can certainly get um, e-commerce shipments to a much closer much closer to the start of that last mile journey. And so, um, you know, we've had some data that we've been able to share with some of our, our hub partners around some of the e-commerce they believe to be moving um, through hubs that we operate at. But you're right, yeah, it's a little bit challenging to know exactly what the volume of those uh, shipments are that we're moving on any daily basis. Digital transformation of uh, American Airlines cargo through IBS side cargo implementation was a massive modernization project of the cargo business and operation. Uh, what's your evaluation of the transformation process as the rollout has been completed? Glad you asked about this one because this has been a major, major focus for our team uh, in 2023. So so as you mentioned, uh, we launched the IBS iCargo platform back in 2019. As we went live with it, you know, there was sort of a settling in period. Uh, we were ensuring the system met the way in which we operate the business. And in some instances, we were changing the way that we operate the business to align with the way the system was set up and developed. And in many cases, it was set up to more of a best practices approach. And so we spent the first couple of years post that integration and launching the platform settling in. In 2023, we took a major undertaking to upgrade to the current version of the platform. We opted not to necessarily move along as new versions were being made available, but did that going to current here in in June of, of 2023. And in fact, we jumped forward about eight versions. So as a result of us jump forward, jumping forward about eight versions, it was a really big effort for our team. It was one that we were working on. We probably spent about seven to eight months in advance of the cutover preparing for that effort. And then we're really busy for the couple of months after the cutover, ensuring that you know all of our processes and systems, the reporting that we could generate from the iCargo system were working. And so really big effort for the team, really proud of, of that effort. You know, the, the way in which I, I talked to my peers as well as the executive leadership team here at American around that effort is that we did a major upgrade without any of our customers feeling any kind of impact. In fact, most of them weren't even aware that we were doing anything. And then we also had zero impact to both the operations of the airline as well as the operations of our cargo business, which, you know, if you know Robert Isom, you've heard Robert Isom, our CEO, talk at all. Um, he, he's very much an ops-focused leader. 
and uh, the airline is intensely focused on operational performance, and we've had fantastic operational performance as a broader airline this year. And so for us to be able to deliver this solution, which unlocks so many new capabilities for us by being on on this most current version, was a real success. And kudos to the team for successfully planning, executing, and leading us through uh, through that, that effort. Greg, are there any other digitalization initiatives, projects that you're currently overseeing uh, to enhance customer experience and improve cargo booking and delivery? There's a, a few of them, Reggie. So look, before I jump off of Vicargo and talk about some of the other ones, you know, one of the great things that iCargo um, provided to us when we went live in 2019 was just an abundance of data that was easy to access, not only in the way our customers were behaving, but as well as how our operation was performing. Uh, that data was something that we really had a hard time getting a hold of before. And, and now there's a rich uh, lake of data, if you will. And we've got all kinds of dashboards. We're utilizing uh, Tableau and Power BI uh, to create dashboards across all aspects of the business. And so our leaders have great insight into how we're performing. And so that's changed the way that we manage the business. So I'd say that's one. The second one that we're really focused on is we've actually established our own API gateway that our AIT team helped us to develop. And we're leveraging that API gateway on a couple of different ways. The first is that we've already established direct connections with a couple of our largest customers. Um, They're able to search for inventory, query pricing, and book within their own uh, cargo management uh, software systems. And the API communicates directly back to iCargo to enable that booking. We're also leveraging that uh, API gateway to do direct connections with our ground handling partners um, throughout the world. It's something that we've been working on for quite a bit of time now and are ready to begin standing that up as we move into the back part of this year. That'll drive a lot of efficiencies at our operations that are handled by third parties, um, which would, would be all of our, our operations you know, on an international basis, and as well as some of our smaller operations um, at spoke cities outside of our hubs here in the US. So we're excited about leveraging that API gateway that we've developed. Uh, digital distribution has also been a very big focus of ours. We've made a number of enhancements to aacargo.com and we continue to do so. Our objective is to make aacargo.com the the easiest place for our customers to do business with us on a digital basis. But we're also leveraging uh, two of our great partners, Web Cargo and Cargo One, and have been live with both of them now for Web Cargo a little over a year, Cargo One not quite a year. We're able to get in front of customers that are maybe new to us or new to us in specific lanes. And so that's been a, a great development for us. The last thing I'd share with you, Reggie, is that you know, we've been really focused on uh, trying to become more nimble in the way in which we make our pricing, uh, our rates available uh, across these digital platforms. And so we've recently, within the last um, couple of months, been able to launch uh, what we call digital rates across um, aacargo.com as well as the third-party distribution platforms. And so we were able to very quickly adjust pricing on a lane by lane basis, depending upon what the market dictates. And we're seeing some really good uptake in bookings as a result of of those um, digital rates, we call them, being launched within our our digital footprint. So really excited about digital transformation. Uh, It's something that we're keenly focused on. Uh, We've got a lot more ideas um, that we'll begin to roll out as we execute in our digital roadmap in 2024. Sustainability is a major topic of discussion and and it's an important uh, priority for aviation. As head of cargo, what are some of the proposals that you have in the areas of science-based approaches to achieve uh, net zero by 2050. Yeah, Reggie, you know, we're, we're very fortunate here at um, at American. A number of uh, the initiatives that are being pursued for our entire airline, including the passenger side of the business, directly benefit uh, the cargo business, right? So a lot of the efforts that we make as, our, uh, as we move towards our goal of zero missions by 2050 benefit the cargo business. Um, things that we're doing around, you know, our refleeting exercise, replacing older, less fuel efficient aircraft with with newer aircraft, that benefits the cargo team. But, you know, in terms of what our goals are, so net zero by 2050 is a stated goal that we've put out there as an airline, but we've got, as you mentioned, a science-based approach to how we get there. And so we've got interim steps that we're also looking to pursue. The first being replacing 10% of our jet fuel uh, by 2030 with SAF. Uh, The second being reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, intensity by 45% in 2035. Uh, the third being to reduce scope two emissions by 40% by 2035. And then, of course, by 2050 as an airline looking to be net zero. And so those are all initiatives that we've 
set out for ourselves, we're, we're taking steps to make that a reality. It'll be a no slam dunk for all participants across all verticals, not just uh, logistics. Um, these goals are something that we'll have to work together on. Distribution of um, you know, alternative fuels is something that really needs to proliferate in order for us to be successful. Uh, and so, you know, Americans have been making investments to try to help with not only um, bringing some of these technologies that will support our sustainability efforts to light, but also the way in which those technologies and solutions get to market. You know, I think specific to cargo, though, the one thing that I'll point out is that, you know, we've, we've been really focused on what we can control within our operations. As you know, you know, we're a large consumer of plastics. We wrap all of our cargo within uh, plastics to ensure it's safe when it goes out on the ramp. And, um, you know, we'd historically used traditional plastics. Well, um, in the beginning of 2022, we began trans transitioning to a company called BioNature, which makes a biodegradable plastic, which we are now using extensively in our operation. We're using it at almost all of our hubs. Um, we're having conversations with many of our third-party handlers in Europe to move to this solution or comparable solutions. What's unique about this plastic is, first of all, it's, it's recyclable, right? And so hopefully it all ends up in a recycle a recycle program. But for the plastic, this bio nature, biodegradable plastic that doesn't end up in, in a recycle bin, if it ends up in a landfill, it biodegrades under normal landfill conditions in about five to 10 years. And so the amount of plastic we use is a lot. In the year 2022 alone, we were able to transition about 130,000 pounds of the plastic use from traditional plastics to biodegradable plastics. And the stat that I've shared in the past, but that it's still just mind boggling to me is that 130,000 pounds of plastics is the equivalent of about 6.4 million plastic water bottles. And so it feels good for our organization, our team to have, have made an impact like that. We're looking for any and all ways in which we continue to do things, not only on the emissions front, but also in other ways in which we can be green and sustainable. Greg, you mentioned about sustainable aviation fuel um, as one of your top priorities and uh a project that uh, American Airlines um, want to pursue in net zero by 2050 goal. Do you expect to have your customers uh, fully on board to make steady progress to use more SAF? Are you able to get your customers on board to purchase sustainable aviation fuel? It's an interesting topic, Reggie. We talk to our customers quite a bit about it. I'd say that depending upon who the shipper is, some shippers have more of an appetite to potentially pay for um, the incremental cost that at the moment is currently associated with sustainable aviation fuel. And so, but that's not the case across the board. You know, in some verticals, for example, fashion. Fashion is a very, you know, forward thinking, conscious industry. And it's one in which, you know, they value uh, having as small of CO2 footprint as they can. Um, but, you know, in general, I'd say that uh, there's still work to be done. We have um, partnered with one of our customers and uh, made SAF available to to them um, in order to help offset you know, the shipment that they are uh, fulfilling for their customers. At the moment, we've got about 620 million gallons of SAF that we have committed to purchase between now and 2030. Much of it comes online and begins to be delivered to us, you know, in 2025 and beyond. And so, um, for the bit of SAF that we have been able to deploy, um, we've been able to share it with some of our customers, uh, and we would hope to do more of that as uh, you know, distribution networks improve and production of SAF uh, increases, which we expect it to, and um, you know, for there to be more opportunities for us to make SAF available to our customers, you know, in a lot of instances, giving them the flexibility to decide how they'd like to deploy it uh, within their own uh, shipper base. Greg, on to my last question. Uh, you made two important investments in two hydrogen development companies uh, to diversify and increase its uh, decarbonization opportunities. Uh, tell us about them. How bullish are you about hydrogen as a reliable alternative to achieve net zero by 2050? I think our, our strategy at American, and this is you know not just cargo but broadly, is we want to position ourselves to you know lead in terms of you know, providing funding, if that makes the most sense, um, providing an opportunity for testing um, with potential solutions to occur. And so for us, we're just trying to have as much exposure to potential solutions that help us to achieve our long-term goals as possible. So in the case of hydrogen, I'd say that those two investments we made are just a couple of examples of ways in which we're further trying to partner with organizations that we think have very unique technologies 
are well-funded with great leadership and could potentially be, you know, a groundbreaking solution that gets us to where we ultimately want to go. So in the case of hydrogen, you mentioned a couple of investments, two that we've made here um, recently. One is um, focused on uh, hydrogen electric propulsion. Um, and so that's on, on the power plant side of things. And, and that would be with Zero Abia. And then the other one is with hydrogen distribution company that's really focused on like, how do you get hydrogen to the point at which it's, it's easily accessible to, you know, in the case, in our case, aviation. And so that, that's uh, universal hydrogen. And so they've been a great partner as well. So, but, you know, kind of thinking about it from both perspectives, distribution, which is incredibly important, as well as, you know, propulsion technologies, um, utilizing hydrogen are the two bets that we've made. You know, certainly us partnering with an investment in these two organizations, you know, provides them with funding to continue their efforts, their research also, you know, provides uh, them with some credibility that, that you know, we, we've done our diligence. We think that these two outfits are um, fantastic partners and, and are part of the solution. But, you know, as I mentioned, there, there's no one single solution. There's going to have to be a, a mosaic of things that we do as an organization and as as an industry and really as global citizens in order to get ourselves to the point where we, we achieve the goals that uh, we've all set out for ourselves. Greg. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for sharing your perspectives on the industry as well as uh, American Airlines cargo business. Yeah, of course, Reggie. It was great talking to you. Uh, thanks to you know all that you do. I appreciate your readers and your viewers. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. That was Greg Schwedinger, president of American Airlines cargo. I hope you enjoyed watching this interview. If yes, like, comment, share and recommend this video to your friends. And more important, if you are not a subscriber of our YouTube channel, please do subscribe now and click the bell icon so that you do not miss any of our new videos. An audio podcast of the series is available on Spotify and on Amazon Music. I highly recommend you check them out. Don't forget to follow Cargo Masterminds on Spotify and Amazon Music. Join me next Monday for another episode of Cargo Masterminds presented by Cargo One. Until we meet again, have a great week ahead. Thank you.